Um, Matt, if I was going to call you that in the episode... Yeah? Do you think we'd need a strong language warning? Yeah, I mean, you call me that in the street, but I don't think we should do it on mic. OK, I think we should probably put a warning on this then. I know it's so hard, Matt, but if I was to say you have to pick one, who would be your favourite out of the Beatles? I mean, I know it's an obvious choice, but as a fan of Thomas the Tank Engine, I've got to go for Ringo Starr. Really? Yeah, it's genius. Right, I didn't expect you to say that. Okay, okay. second favourite. Second favourite Beatle. Easy, George Harrison. I've got my mind set on you. I love his solo yeah, stuff. Yeah, no, we all do. Okay, so, different scenario. They're off the table. They're not in the mix. Who is your favourite Beatle? Oh, it's hard. I guess Paul McCartney. Are you taking the piss? John Lennon? Yes. Would it have killed you to say that first? You are going to love this series. Eighth of December, 1980, Sheraton Hotel, New York. In his hotel room, Mark David Chapman takes a Gideon Bible from a cracked leather holdall, opens it at the Gospel of John, and adds the word Lenin with a gold pen before placing it on the polished teak bureau. His heart thuds with nervous excitement as he pictures the room swarming with FBI agents. Then he straightens his aviator glasses in the mirror tells himself to focus. He puts John Lennon and Yoko Ono's new record, Double Fantasy, under his arm, takes a hotel-branded pen from the bedside table and pockets the scrap of paper on which he's scrawled an address. Dakota Apartments, 1 West 72nd Street. Finally, from the bottom of the holdall, he takes the loaded 38 revolver and slowly fingers its cold, heavy smoothness before stuffing it down his pants. He heads for the door, leaving his room key. He won't be coming back here as long as he has the bottle to go through with it. He leaves via the main entrance. The weather's unnaturally warm, almost spring-like. Two blocks away, he finds a run-down bookstore. He buys a copy of Catcher in the Rye and scribbles the words, this is my statement, across the first page. Holden Coalfield gets it. This world is full of phonies. Phonies like John Lennon, singing about peace and poverty from his penthouse apartment, turning his back on God, Jesus and the Beatles to worship Yoko. These phonies need to be eliminated. Then he walks to West 72nd Street and waits outside the imposing apartment block. Hours pass. Mark paces, trying to get the feeling back in his feet. Then, in a flurry of security guards, There he is, right in front of him, John Lennon. Trademark round sunglasses, leather jacket, fur collar turned up, taking Mark's record and signing his name with the hotel pen. So close, Mark could trace the stubble on his cheeks. He's smaller in real life. Mark's chest thuds. His hand goes to the butt of the revolver, digging into his hip, but he can't do it. As the door of the black armoured limousine opens for John, Mark curses himself. This is the second time he's made this journey to New York and the second time he's failed. But then John pauses. A smile splits across his face. Mark follows his gaze. And that's when he sees her, face hidden behind long black hair. That bitch that destroyed the Beatles and turned Mark's hero into a phony. Mark's body burns like a lit fuse. He can hear blood rushing in his ears. His hand is reaching for the gun. The butt is cold against his palm. He readies his stance, cocks the revolver, stares his target directly in the eye. And fires. From Wondery, I'm Alice Levine. And I'm Matt Ford. And this is British Scandal. The show where every week we bring you stories from this green and not always so pleasant land. British scandals come in many shapes and sizes. Some are about money, 
some are about sex. They're all about power. But when we look at scandals a bit closer, they turn out to be stranger, wilder, just plain weirder than we remember. So we're journeying back to ask who's to blame for what happened. And when the dust settled, did anything really change? OK, Matt, putting you on the spot again, as ever. Who would you say the all-time great duos? Oof, so many to choose from. Ronnie and Reggie, Thelma and Louise, uh, but maybe even Bonnie and Clyde. Funny that you've gone immediately for criminal mastermind partnerships. Uh, I was thinking more musical duos, to be specific. OK, Liam and Noel. Of course. Uh, Daphne and Celeste. <laughs> Goes without saying. Uh, Je and Edward. <laughs> Rolls off the tongue. But obviously, I'm guessing you're leading me towards Lennon and McCartney. I absolutely am. We are going to hear a lot about them this series. What do you know about the breakup of the Beatles? I imagine a lot. Well, I guess the obvious stuff, the the drug taking, the pressure of Beatlemania, but more than anything, what everyone always says is Yoko. I'm glad you said that because this series, we are going to interrogate the narrative around Yoko Ono and think about how much of a role, if any, she had in breaking up the Beatles. This is the story of the scandalous, historic breakup of the biggest band in British history. We can't stress that enough. And the woman in the eye of the storm, probably the most demonised woman in the country at that time. There's sex, there's drugs, and you best believe there's rock and roll. This is episode one, Julia. <laughs> Twenty-six years earlier, the 16th of May, 1956, Quarry Bank Grammar School, Liverpool. 16-year-old John Lennon storms down the grey stone steps of the looming Gothic building, kicking out a metal bin as he crosses the playground. John's no stranger to getting into trouble. Starting here in third form, he struggled to fit in. Boys called him Four Eyes and questioned why he lived with his aunt. Where was his dad? Was it true his mum was a slut? Then he realised he could make his classmates laugh and established himself as a regular class clown. We know it, Matt. We love it. We've both been there. <laughs> but today, things have gone too far. His English book, full of obscene sketches of the teaching staff, has been discovered and John has been suspended for a week. He can't go home. His Aunt Mimi would erupt. So instead, he walks aimlessly, eyes on the ground as he cuts across a park. Suddenly, he finds himself staring up at his mother's grey pebble dash semi. Bit of trivia. If you want to know what that house looks like, it's the cover to Oasis's Live Forever single. It's that semi-detached house. Great fact. He stops. He shouldn't be here. He might only live three miles away, but he hasn't been here in over a year. After John's dad left when he was six years old, his aunt Mimi complained to social services about his mother Julia's lifestyle and took custody of him. After that, Julia's visits were few and far between, often ending in bitter rows between the sisters. He tentatively pushes open the rotten wooden gate, taking in the cracked window panes, bright colored toys scattered across the lawn and mismatched deck chairs positioned in the sun. He peers through the window into the cluttered living room, but can't bring himself to ring the bell. The idea of being rejected all over again. He can't face it. His chest aches. This was a mistake. He goes to leave. And that's when he sees her. It's you. She's even more beautiful than he remembers. Auburn hair and red lipstick. Dropping her shopping bags and rushing towards him. He's momentarily taken aback. Unsure how to react but finds himself being coaxed into the house. Inside, John sits next to Julia on a patched up pink velvet sofa as she chatters about anything and everything to fill the silence. Oddly nervous, John nods back at her with a strained smile. Suddenly, she stands up with a flourish. I feel like dancing. Tell me you like music, John. John shrugs and mutters that his uncle George bought him a mouth organ before he died. His cheeks burn when Julia laughs. She puts a single on the dance set. 
John finds himself leaning forward. The voice is extraordinary, like nothing he's heard before. And the words, it's like they're being spoken directly to him, echoing his anger and frustration. School, the sketches, the suspension, it all melts away. For the first time, John feels completely seen, understood. Who is this? Elvis Presley? He's a looker just like you. But the music like, what is it? This Johnny boy is rock and roll. Julia replaces the needle and begins spinning John around the room. He can't stop himself beaming. In the last three minutes, his whole world has transformed and all he knows now is that he needs to hear more. A few days later, Hesse's music shop, Stanley Street, Liverpool. John inhales the scent of cedarwood and polish. I love that smell. Oh, so good. It's up there with, I would say, church is probably the top smell. <laughs> because you get the cedarwood, the polish, plus the stone and the incense. <laughs> you smell nice. What do you smell of? It's church by Izzy Miyake. <laughs> oh, right, nice. <laughs> Julia points excitedly at the Gallotone champion guitar hanging from the wall. Try that one next. John laughs and nods at the exasperated shop assistant. They've been here for almost an hour, John messing around on the different models with no idea how to play them, and Julia loudly announcing him as the legendary John Lennon to an imaginary crowd. But the moment he slings the gallo tone across his chest, he knows this one's different. Somehow it feels right. The weight of it, the way its curves fit his body, like it's meant for him. And Julia clearly sees it too, because in an instant, she's rushing over to the shop assistant and demanding, how much? John tries to cut in. Mum, please, you can't afford it. But Julia ignores him and starts begging the shop assistant to give her credit. Awestruck, John looks down at the guitar. With it, he feels like he could do anything, achieve anything. A few hours later, John nervously swings open the iron gate of 251 Menlove Avenue. His aunt's interwar semi is immaculate, with flower beds cut at perfect right angles, a freshly mown lawn and a clematis climbing the pebble dash around the newly painted porch. He's plotting how to get the guitar past Aunt Mimi. He could say a friend lent it to him, but one glance at the shiny red casing and John knows she would never believe someone gave it away. So as he edges open the white front door, he decides his best option is to hide it. He's halfway up the stairs <clears throat> when he hears an indignant cough from the dining room. Yeah, I'll be there in a minute. No, now, John Lennon. Her tone tells him not to argue. He carefully props up the guitar by the hall dresser and hurries into the dining room, bearing what he hopes is a charming smile. His Aunt Mimi sits, drumming her unpainted fingernails on the table, her mouth set in a thin line. She pushes a letter across the table. John sees the school crest, John Lennon and suspension. His smile falters. I've been onto the school all day, begging them not to throw you out. Then comes the lecture. You used to be so bright. The world was your oyster. It's my fault. I coddled you. John stares at the swirls on the Axminster carpet. Now you're a layabout with no ambition. John can't keep quiet any longer. He has ambition. Before he can stop himself, he's racing back into the hall and presenting Mimi with the guitar. He's going to learn to play, become a musician. Mimi eyes the guitar with disgust. Wherever did you get that? John's too angry to lie. Julia gave it me. John watches as the colour drains from Mimi's face. She falls silent, and John feels an immediate pang of regret. He didn't want to hurt her. John, you will get nowhere listening to your mother and her ridiculous fancies. Stung, 
John retreats upstairs. In his room, he lights up and leans on the windowsill, blowing smoke into the night, trying to push Mimi's hurt expression out of his head. But he meant what he said. He's going to start a band, a rock and roll band, and he's going to prove them all wrong. Mimi, his teachers, the whole world. Sixteenth of July, 1957, Liverpool. Fifteen-year-old Paul McCartney is bored stiff. His dad forced him to come here. You always loved the Walton summer fate. Paul doesn't want to tell him that was years ago. He knows his old man's been trying since his mum passed away. So now he wanders listlessly through the fate, past the donkey rides and hoopla, the tent of people measuring marrows, the women in their Sunday best, arguing over trestle tables of Victoria sponges. From nowhere, a microphone squeaks into life. Paul's shocked to see a group of teddy boys sauntering onto the bandstand in checked shirts and drainpipe trousers. When they start playing, elderly ladies cover their ears. Maybe things are about to get interesting. The band announce themselves as the Quarrymen. They aren't exactly good, but through the ear-splitting feedback and clumsy chord changes, Paul has to admit they've got something. Imagine thinking that 15 I know, just thinking that, so full of it. I can't quite put my finger on what it is, but there's a certain je ne sais quoi about you boys. Sorry, are you 15? Yes, I am. <laughs> and the more he watches, the more he's sure that that something is their charismatic frontman. Handsome, his hair cut into a quiff, improvising bawdy lyrics to the songs and flirting with older women in the audience. A keen bedroom guitarist, Paul's been desperate to join a rock and roll band ever since he heard Heartbreak Hotel. Could these guys be it? They certainly look in need of a guitarist who knows what he's doing. After the set, Paul heads over to a lanky teenager, packing away the microphones, asks where he can find the lead singer. John, he's over there. He points to where the band are smoking behind the coconut shy. Watch out, though. He's a right dick. Thinks he's Elvis Presley. John's certainly intimidating off stage. Clearly a couple of years older than Paul, he looks him up and down with a sneer. But Paul holds his nerve, calmly explains he wants to join their band, and reaches for John's guitar before he can stop him. Paul plays a few riffs. It's good. He knows it. But when he looks up at John, he's lighting another cigarette, barely looking at him. Where'd you learn that song? I wrote it. Paul watches John's eyebrows raise. He's clearly impressed. So? John pauses, breathes smoke in Paul's face. Sorry, kid, we ain't got time to be babysitting. Call us in a few years. Paul feels his face redden. Enjoy playing Village Fates forever then. Real rock and roll crowd you got here. And he storms off to find his dad. I know it's not the right thing for people to take sides, but based on that early interaction, I would say I am Team Paul. Hard not to be, isn't it? The next day, Paul's buttoning his blazer when there's a knock at his front door. John stands on his doorstep, guitar slung over his shoulder, muttering something about getting Paul's address from a mate from primary school. Sorry, school's off for today, kid. We've got more important things to be getting on with. Paul tries to hide his excitement. He knows this is the start of something big. Fifteenth of July, 1958, Casbar Club, Liverpool. John runs a roller across the damp brick cellar wall, groaning at the black paint now splattered across his only white shirt. His back is soaked with sweat. The fumes are making his head throb. He's had enough. He turns to Paul, who's running a brush across the mouldy skirting boards. Some audition this is. Let's get out of here. Now you heard her. This is the first part. Then she'll hear us play. Liverpool's new Casbar Club isn't exactly what John was expecting. A bar and a stage built out of pallets, crammed into the cellar of its owner, Mona Best's, family home. So this is Mona Best, who's the mum of Pete Best, who's their first drummer before they sack him for Ringo. Exactly, yes. 
But Julia had arranged the audition for what would be the quarrymen's first residency. So they turned up in black suits and bootlace ties, eager to impress, only to find a stack of paint cans waiting for them. I can't imagine Harry Styles going through this. <laughs> like Simon Cowell saying, Harry, I've got you a big gig, you're doing Madison Square Garden, but you do have to deal with the dry rot and the damp first. <laughs> I mean, it would make you really appreciate that moment when you walked on stage though, wouldn't it? John hears a polite cough. A skinny boy with thick bush eyebrows and sunken cheekbones stands awkwardly in the doorway, clutching an enormous guitar. Am I in the right place for the audition? John's about to send him packing when Paul goes over and slaps the boy on the back. Hey lads, meet me mate. This is George Harrison. Paul explains that he met George on the school bus. They jammed together on the back seat. Is that how easy it was to get into the Beatles? <laughs> right bus, the right time. He's got real talent, John. With him on rhythm guitar, there's no way Mona can turn us down. John eyes the newcomer suspiciously. You got a growth problem or something? How old is he? George's pale face reddens as he mutters that he's nearly 15. Join the Beatles at 14. That this is, is nuts! Oh. John is fuming. He might have allowed Paul, 18 months as junior, into the band, but that doesn't mean they're a kids' club. But Paul insists they hear him play. George crouches down to unzip his guitar case. John's shocked when he pulls out a stunning, cello-style Hofner President in a brunette sunburnt finish. How the hell did he get that? Nicky! George ignores him and strums the intro to Bill Justice's raunchy, brow furrowed. Raunchy was the equivalent of Moose T's horny, <laughs> but in the 50s. He's halfway through when Mona Best, her round, smiling face framed with long black curls, walks in with a tray of builder's tea. John takes a deep breath. He can't deny the kid's got talent. He can play in the audition, but I ain't saying he's in the band. John crosses Allerton Golf Course with a jaunty spring in his step. The Quarrymen are now the Casbar Club's first resident band. And with George's input, they're actually sounding good. Everything's coming together. And his mum is the first person he wants to tell. But after five minutes of furious knocking, Julia's partner opens the door. Pack that racket in, will you? She's gone to visit her sister. John can't believe it. Aunt Mimi. John turns to walk up the garden path ecstatic, like he can't feel the earth under his beetle crushes. The shoes that gave the band the name. Looks to camera. Aunt Mimi's patching things up with Julia. His splintered up family's finally becoming whole. But when he turns onto Menlove Avenue, traffic's stopped. Neighbours' doors are all wide open. A large crowd has gathered. But everyone is oddly silent. Through their legs, John can just make out a sundress, streaked with dirt. Before he knows what's happening, Mimi's racing up to him and demanding he not look. He doesn't get it. Look at what? I offered to walk her to the bus stop. She said she'd be all right. What? Mimi's nails dig into his shoulders. She never cries, but her pupils are shiny with tears. The blue lights of an ambulance swing into the avenue. Your mother, she's been hit by a car. I'm so sorry, John. She's dead. <laughs> 7th of September, 1958. Liverpool College of Art. Cynthia Powell puts down her fountain pen and glances towards the back of the musty classroom. Mildew-stained artwork peels from the walls. On the back row are the teddy boys and girls, framed by a cloud of cigarette smoke, leaning back on their chairs, suede shoes resting on the desks. Sometimes she wishes she was one of them. She's tried, swapping her tweed skirts for velvet pants and ditching her glasses, although it means she can't see the number of her bus. She even thought about bleaching her hair. Then she pulled herself together, because deep down, she knows she has to concentrate. When her dad died of lung cancer last year, her mother took in lodgers to put Cynthia through college so that she could get into teacher training 
become an art teacher. And Cynthia's determined her mum's efforts won't go to waste. Cynthia picks up her pen again and tries to concentrate on her lettering. But one of the boys has taken out his guitar and is strumming Buddy Holly so loudly she can hardly think. Now that sounds quite cute, doesn't it? Strumming Buddy Holly in a classroom. What you have to remember is, this is 1958. That is the equivalent of loud boys at the back of the class blaring whatever rubbish it is they listen to on a boom bar or a Bluetooth speaker. What would be the equivalent now, Matt? What would they be playing? Oh, <laughs> Skrillex or drill music. Something that you just can't get into. I think Skrillex is retired. I think Skrillex is 58. No way. Is that like out of date now? You're like, probably Chumbawamba or whatever they're listening to. <laughs> the lightning seeds or something horrible like that. Turning, she sees it's John in a thick wool coat and rolled up jeans. The most carefree of the lot. He preens his immaculate quiff more often than he picks up a paintbrush. Cynthia is about to shoot him an exasperated look, remind him that some people are trying to work. Then she stops. There's something in his face as he plays. Vulnerability. Sadness. Her eyes meet John's. For a second, he's sheepish, awkward even, before hurriedly putting down his guitar and making a smutty wisecrack. Cynthia feels herself blush. She turns in embarrassment, lowers her eyes and forces herself to concentrate on her calligraphy. But she can feel his eyes on her back. At the end of the day, Cynthia spots John kicking a phone box near the bus stop. Normally, she'd roll her eyes and walk to the next stop. But today, she goes over. She sits quietly and waits for him to call her a middle-class spaniel or make one of his no-dirty-jokes at Cynthia jibes. But instead, he keeps kicking. John, are you OK? He doesn't answer. Cynthia opens her mouth to speak. She can't believe she's talking to him like this. She barely knows him. But somehow, after seeing his face when he played, she knows he'll understand. I heard about your mum. I'm so sorry. I lost my dad too. Last year. It's tough. You think you're getting on okay and then it just... hits you all over again. John looks at her, surprised. He hesitates before muttering. So fucking unfair. I was only just getting to know her. Suddenly they're talking about his mum leaving, about being brought up by his aunt, about her mum working every hour to put her through college. When Cynthia's bus approaches, she lets it sail by. That night, Cynthia waits for her mother to go to bed. Then she takes the square box from her college bag and slips into the bathroom, making sure to lock the door behind her. As the peroxide burns her scalp, she wonders if she's made a terrible mistake. That's why I would never dye my hair. That's why you will never be with a beetle. <laughs> the next day, Cynthia walks into calligraphy class to a chorus of giggling from the back of the room. Her once mousy brown hair is now a yellowish white. She hunches her shoulders, wishing she could make herself invisible. Who was she kidding? She'll never be one of these people. But then, over the cacophony of sniggering, John, his voice charged with admiration. Get you, Miss Prim. You look like Bridget Bardo. His attention makes her flush. She begins to preoccupy herself by adding gold details to her lettering when she hears the familiar strum of his guitar playing Ain't She Sweet. When Cynthia turns, knocking over the ink pot, she realizes he's singing it to her. She feels an exhilarating rush as though it's just her and John in the room. And in that moment, she decides she's going to make John hers. August 1960, Hamburg. John and Paul stagger out of the battered Austin van, mouths agape. They're no prudes, but the Reaper Barn sex district is like nothing they've ever seen before. Neon red signs, clubbers in drag and bondage, sex workers pressing their naked flesh against windows, promising a good time. None of the boys have ever been outside of the UK, 
and this feels a long way from the dank streets of Liverpool. John has renamed the band The Beatles, an ode to his hero Buddy Holly and the Crickets. And tonight the band played their first European show. Nerves, excitement and possibility jangle inside him. In the Kaiser Keller Club, plywood stapled to the walls, the floor sticky with spilt beer, air thick with sweat and sex, the club's manager, Bruno Koschmeider, runs through the deal. They'll be playing only covers. If it goes well, they'll get a residency. If not, they'll be packed into the battered Austin van and sent back to England. The set will be five hours long. Yeah, I think we'll just get in the van and go back to England, please. <laughs> John fiddles nervously with the silver chain Cynthia gave him. Five hours? Most we've played is 45 minutes. How are we supposed to keep going that long? Bruno shrugs and takes a small pink pill out of his breast pocket and holds it out to John. Preludin. It stimulates. John rolls his eyes and pockets the pill. He's hardly going on stage off his face. But two hours later, John is starting to panic. The band has only been playing for an hour and they're already running short on cover songs. John anxiously glances at Paul and then at Bruno, who's shouting, Come on, guys, make a show! To make matters worse, the crowd has thinned, and those that have stayed appear more interested in each other than the band. John's heart sinks. He's the leader. If anyone's going to save them, it's him. So he puts down his guitar and pops the little pink pill. Uh-oh. Paul turns to him wide-eyed. What are you doing? 30 minutes later, John's gone full-on Gene Vincent, throwing the mic around, rolling on the floor, pretending he has a bad leg. The audience stop chatting and screwing. They start swarming to the front of the stage. By the time they've finished, the room is packed. A wild frenzy in the air. You wouldn't want them to get too close to the front, would you? Just back off a bit. If you you want... lot that were screwing, you back off. Wash yourself off first and then get to the front. <laughs> yeah. There's flannels in a bucket to the <laughs> left. In the morning, John wakes up on a grubby mattress in a back room of the club. Head pounding, Sahara mouth. A naked girl asleep either side of him. It takes a second for the guilt to hit him. He leaps up from the tangle of limbs, heart racing. He adores Cynthia. She's his rock. He's not sure what he would have done these last few months without her kind-hearted support. He can't lose her. He can't. Suddenly, a delighted Bruno Koschmeider bursts in, offering the group an eight-week residency. John's joy is coupled with a creeping dread. Here, he's surrounded by beer, women and pills. Yes, but what are the downsides? <laughs> Without Cynthia's calm smile and steadying glances, he's just not sure he can trust himself. Lunchtime on the 5th of April, 1961, Liverpool. Cynthia sways half-heartedly in the nauseating musk of Liverpool's underground cavern club and tries to pretend like nothing is wrong. The air is thick with brick dust and a stagnant stench, not quite masked by the beer and cigarette smoke. Hundreds of teenagers course together. It's hot. Around her, girls faint. Their limp bodies are crowd surfed towards the exit. But today, Cynthia's mind is anywhere but here. This morning, Cynthia found out she'd failed her final exam. Then she went to the doctor's surgery and was told she was pregnant. In the space of a few hours, all Cynthia's dreams have crumbled. And she's sure she's going to lose John as well. A baby is definitely not part of his plan. Back from Hamburg with bowl cut hair, polo necks and leather jackets, the Beatles have been tearing up the Cavern Club every Saturday lunchtime for months now. They've been playing their own songs, They've even got their own niche fan base. And today, Brian Epstein is in the crowd. Epstein manages his family's record store on Great Charlotte Street, and John is convinced he's the man to make them big. 
Epstein's role in the Beatles is profound. He doesn't just manage them in a kind of PR sense. He really is a father figure to them, and he's crucial in keeping them motivated and creative. He really is a complete contrast to people like Malcolm McLaren and the way he treated the Sex Pistols. Particularly important because they're teenagers, you know, that paternal role, that pastoral care is essential. When the show finally ends, Cynthia reluctantly heads down the damp steps to the dressing room. She can't put this off any longer. She has to talk to John. But the band aren't alone. Brian Epstein is unnaturally clean and sharp-suited for the Cavern Club, addressing the band with drama school-trained confidence. First, we'll look for a contract, record an LP. Then we can start thinking about touring. Cynthia tries desperately to catch John's eye, but he, like the rest of the band, is nodding along with a serious face, trying to seem professional. Of course, if I'm going to manage you, I have conditions. You'll have to clean up your look, stop eating on stage, stopping songs halfway through. Oh, and I need you to pretend you're single. The teenage girls need to believe they can have you. That's ridiculous. Anger pours out of Cynthia before she can rein it in. Reddening, she storms out of the dressing room and up the stairs. This isn't happening. Half an hour later, John appears. What on earth's got into you, Sin? He ain't saying we can't go steady or anything. We just can't shout about it. Embarrassed, Cynthia mumbles an apology and John wraps her into a hug. Face buried into his rough sweater, she manages... I'm... I'm sorry. I'm pregnant. She feels John's whole body stiffen. She's scared to step back, look at his face. She has no idea how she's going to do this on her own. But then she feels John relax, squeeze her tighter. Well, there's nothing for it, Sin. We'll have to get married. As he clings to her, Cynthia realises she's been holding her breath. She lets herself think, maybe this is going to be okay. After all, she, John, the baby, they're going to be a proper family. She vows to put everything into making this marriage work. Fifth of September, 1962, Abbey Road Studios, London. John stares in awe at the rows of desks and dials, the plush carpeted booths where shoes make no sound, the little brunette bringing them coffee and beer. That's what they call uppers and downers, isn't it? Yeah, that's what they're talking about. Before, recording for the Beatles meant crowding round a single microphone in someone's bedroom. But today, Abbey Road Studios is their playground. If he's honest, John's relieved to be in London. He loves Cynthia, but finds married life embarrassing. Like walking round with odd socks and your flies open. I'd love to see his wedding photos. <laughs> Here, he gets to feel like himself again. EMI's record producer arrives late, with a harried expression on his face. He wears a sharp white blazer, short salt and pepper hair combed into an immaculate side parting. George Martin. He nods a distracted greeting. So this is also very important. George Martin is known as the fifth Beatle. He effectively produced them and is responsible for how so much of their albums sound and is so creatively involved in the way that they write music. So this is, this is another massive meeting. John knows George Martin's not convinced about the Beatles. In fact, he rejected their lousy tape at first. It's taken all of Brian Epstein's charm to persuade him to sign them, to Parlophone, EMI's smallest label. But that just makes John more determined. Martin hands out sheets of thin copy paper with lyrics printed on. The boys share suspicious glances. Your first single. It's called How You Do It, written by a chap called Mitch Murray. We're confident it's going to be a hit. We ain't playing our own stuff. John scans the lyrics. They're empty, cheesy. There's none of the tongue-in-cheek irony of his work with Paul. But Paul shoots him a warning look. John fights every instinct and bites his tongue. They knew a record contract meant compromises. After a couple of half-hearted limps through the song... Martin holds up his hands and walks over to Ringo Starr. 
their drummer. He's new, a catch, poached from Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, their rival Liverpool band. But Martin is shaking his head. I think we'll bring in a session drummer for this particular track. Oh man, looking back now, this is bonkers. Ringo slams his sticks down and stalks out. John can't keep quiet any longer. You're going to keep going till there's none of us left. There's a tide of rage flowing out of John now. And what kind of Pollyanna shit is this anyway? You know, we'd get the crap ripped out of us if we played this in Liverpool. George Martin tries to cut in with a firm, scolding hand. But John's not finished. We've got a track we want to play you. If you hate it, then maybe this isn't going to work. The words come out of John's mouth before he's sure if he means them. He just prays the risk will pay off. Or the Beatles could be over before they've recorded a single note. George Martin inspects his Rolex. Do you realise how much the studio time is costing? But still, he sits down. John turns to George and Paul and mouths, Love me do. They're playing out of their skins. John can feel it riffing off each other in total perfect synergy. He dares to look up. George Martin is whistling through his teeth. It's going to take an enormous amount of work. John throws a gleeful look at Paul and George. Suddenly, George Martin's assistant rushes in, breathless. Telephone call for Mr John Lennon? I can't. It's urgent. John reluctantly slopes out of the room and picks up the receiver. On the end of the line, Aunt Mimi's voice is unnaturally high. It's time. The baby's coming. He has to get back to Liverpool. John thumps the receiver against his forehead. He knows he should go, be there for sin, the baby. He's determined not to be the absent failure his father was. But as he looks through the glass of the recording booth, the gold discs hanging on the wall, the band excitedly waiting for him, John feels himself being pulled both ways. Aunt Mimi calls his name down the receiver. He now needs to choose. Cynthia or the band. February the 10th, 1964, Kennedy Airport, New York. The Pan Am jet comes to a juddering halt on the tarmac. Cynthia Lennon smooths her brand new lemon leather coat, checks her cat eyeliner in her compact mirror and grips John's hand tightly. She can tell he's nervous. Back home, the Beatles are famous. Everywhere she goes with John, they're followed by spine tingling screams. And every day, she has to shove little Julian's pushchair through crowds of teenage girls to reach their fancy new London flat. The papers have even given it a name, Beatlemania. But America still terrifies John. More than once, he's muttered about Cliff Richard dying over there, being 14th on the bill to Frankie Avalon. John shuffles out into the aisle, still clinging onto his hand, Cynthia follows. But Brian Epstein pushes past her, Cynthia, perhaps you should hang back. She knows he doesn't want her there. He's still determined to convince fans John's single. But when, after an argument, John suggested she come, Cynthia leapt at the chance. Cynthia knows John loves Julian deep down. He even named him after his mother. But he missed his son's birth and has been distant ever since, always recording and touring. She'd hoped to bring Julian to America, had images of John walking round Times Square with his son on his shoulders, or the two of them on an LA beach playing in the ocean. But that's where Brian had firmly drawn the line. There's a sudden buzz of excitement. Cynthia cranes her neck to make out thousands of shrieking fans lining every tier of the terminal with Beatles Forever placards. It would do your head in, wouldn't it? It would be the pits. Cynthia rubs her forehead. She feels a migraine coming on. Technicolor lights flash before her eyes as she tries to keep up with the group. Grabbing hands tear her coat. Like a zombie apocalypse, this. Dizzy and nauseous, she staggers to the front entrance before realising there's no car waiting. How could they leave her? How could John not notice? 
By the time Cynthia's yellow cab pulls up outside the Plaza Hotel, darkness is settling. All she wants to do is collapse into bed. But a thick-set security guard raises his hand. Nobody sees the Beatles. No, you don't understand. John Lennon, he's my husband. They all say that, ma'am. Cynthia feels all hope draining out of her until she hears a high-pitched voice. A girl no more than 14 with blue eyeshadow and a Mrs. George Harrison poster. She is. She's Cynthia Lennon. Cynthia watches bemused as the fan takes a crumpled copy of Life magazine out of her bag. In the furthest corner, Cynthia can just make out her own face. That's her, see? A murmur of consensus flows round the group until finally, to Cynthia's relief, the burly security guard steps aside. The penthouse suite is packed with baskets of sickly flowers. John is already in bed, muttering with a voice gravelly from sleep. Don't be so bloody slow next time. They could have killed you. Cynthia fumes. Fat lot you'd have cared. Just admit it. You don't care about me or Julian. Just yourself. Like your father. She spits out the words. She wants a reaction from John. An acknowledgement of how hard the last few months have been on her. But he rolls over, turning his back. She spins around, slamming the bedroom door behind her. She tells herself she's not going to be humiliated like that again. She's had enough of running after John. She's booking the first flight back to London. Fifteenth of May, 1965, Bayswater, London. John yawns and slumps back into a white boucle armchair. His eyes scan the room's futuristic decor, the white plastic dining table, and psychedelic wall hangings at odd with the apartment's cavernous Victorian bones. He wishes he could leave. He's used to feeling trapped these days. In his marriage, trapped recording the same catchy singles for screaming teens, and right now, trapped at a lacklustre dinner party with George, his fiancée Patty, and George's dentist, John Riley, who seems to view himself as a celebrity by association. It doesn't reflect well on Lennon, does it, this mindset? Because it's a very negative appraisal of actually a very special position. Trapped in a marriage and trapped writing songs, you're like, well, you've got someone who absolutely adores you, has given you a son, and you've got this amazing career. Team McCartney, I see. <laughs> I feel like you've got an agenda. I mean, being... Trapped in a relationship you don't want to be in. Very claustrophobic. Trapped professionally in a creative cycle that's deeply unfulfilling. Also maddening. Okay. Are you trying to tell me something? (laughs) Just saying two sides to every story. He's not sure how much more conversation about property and commuting he can take. Of course, Cynthia's enjoying herself, though. In a new mini dress bought specially for the occasion. John Riley brings out the after-dinner coffees. Thank God. John wants to escape from these bourgeois pleasantries as quickly as possible. But as he sips his drink, the room begins to double, then triple in size. He throws a questioning look back to Riley, but finds his face has transformed into a cackling demon, huge mouth laced with fangs. A woman is screaming. John takes a beat to realise it's Cynthia. Knelt on the floor like a cat coughing up a furball, What have you done to us? LSD, isn't it wonderful? The demon replies with a sneer. I mean, whatever you say about Starbucks, you'd never get this, do you? (laughs) I don't know, sometimes the frappa mochaccinos make me want to do this. George drives his Mini Cooper back to John and Cynthia's home at 18 miles per hour. Face pressed against the windscreen, muttering occasionally about spaceships. Hurtling into the bathroom, Cynthia throws Julian's plastic toy boats into the landing before trying to vomit up the poison. But John is enthralled by visions of a sea with a thousand faces looking up to heaven. And in its depths, a yellow submarine. The next day, John turns the pages of his notebook in double quick time, tries to remember his visions as he scrawls lyrics down on paper. He hasn't felt this excited since he first heard Elvis Presley, back in Julia's living room. He reaches for some trousers and, ignoring Julian eating his boiled egg, rushes to the waiting car. 
a whole new world has just unfurled and he has to tell the boys. This could be the thing to take them to a whole new level. And it does because it changes the sound of the music that the Beatles start to create. Them taking acid does alter their output. I mean, it transforms the sound. It transforms him in a way. Imagine if you dabbled and then came in here into this recording booth and your jokes were just, they were just on another plane. It would just be hard to go back, wouldn't it, to just the same old boring Matt Ford. (laughs) How would that feel? Well, on the plus side, (laughs) dear listener, that's what you've got to look forward to. British scandal, the acid years. (laughs) Ninth of November, 1966, Indica Gallery, London. John's on a come down. His suit is creased, his face rough with stubble. The swarming Westminster streets make his head feel like it's about to split in two. He's not exactly in the mood for modern art. But when the gallery owner, John Dunbar, described the work of a subversive Japanese artist called Yoko Ono, John couldn't help but be intrigued. According to Dunbar, Her work is about artistic process, not product. It's anti-capitalist, genre-busting. And one of her films consists of pictures of people's bottoms. OK, I'm warming to it. John doesn't understand it, and that excites him. As he enters the gallery, he screws up his eyes, dazzled by the all-white walls. The exhibition's not open yet, and he's got the place entirely to himself. He sees a woman eyeing him curiously through a sheet of straight, dark hair. So thin, he could wrap his arms around her twice. Dressed in a black two-piece, her feet are bare. What are you doing here? I'm still working. In that moment, John's not sure. He tries to flash her a grin, but it comes out awkward and lopsided. Yoko shepherds John to one side like a nuisance child and begins assessing the positioning of a blank white canvas. There's nothing on it. It's called hammer and nail. I invite the visitors to hammer a nail into the canvas. Go on then, where's the hammer? But Yoko's mouth sets into a thin line. Like I said, we're not open. So John pinches his fingers into an invisible nail and screws up his fist like a hammer. Yoko eyes him dismissively before turning her attention to an apple on a plinth, titled Apple. John can't help but laugh. You do this for a living. Before she can stop him, John grabs the apple and takes a sizable bite. You know, they sell them for two bob down the grocers. I think you should leave. Now. Stunned, John watches as Yoko beckons over a security guard. Nobody speaks to him like that anymore. The words spill out of his mouth before he's sure he means them. Do you want to go out with me sometime? Yoko barely takes a second to consider him. No. And then, as he stalks towards the exit, she adds with a challenging smile. You'll have to try harder than that. And from that moment, John can think of nothing but the rude little artist with the bare feet and the beautiful hair and the empty canvas. And he knows, deep down inside him, that this woman is somehow going to change his life. This is the first episode in our series, The Ballad of Yoko and John. A quick note about our dialogue. In most cases, we can't know exactly what was said, but all our dramatizations are based on historical research. If you'd like to know more about this story, you can read John by Cynthia Lennon, John Lennon, The Life by Philip Norman, and Yoko Ono, An Artful Life by Donald Brackett. I'm Matt Ford. And I'm Alice Levine. Lydia Marchant wrote this episode. Additional writing by Alice Levine and Matt Ford. Sound design by Granny Eats Wolf. Script editing by James Magniak. British Scandal is produced by Samizdat Audio. Our associate producer is Francesca Gallardi Quadrio Corsio. Our producer is Millie Chu. The senior producer is Joe Sykes. Our executive producers are Jenny Lower Beckman, Stephanie Jens, and Marshall Louie for Wondry. Listener.